Hey guys, Delby here. Welcome back to the channel. Today we're looking at the Canadian legend Simon Doty. I really like Simon's music. He's got a kind of unique fusion of tech house, house and progressive, all put together in a really interesting way. It gives him a real signature sound. It's interesting, well-produced music and it's super functional. It works really well in the club. Over the past couple of years, his career has really gone from strength to strength, especially since his big releases on Anjuna Deep and Knee Deep in Sound. So today, we're gonna to dig in and see if we can figure out what makes these songs tick. If you like the track that you can hear in the background right now, it's my new one with floor play on Monday Social called Lovely Day. It's currently sitting at number six in the Organic House Top 10 on Beatport. If you wanna grab a copy and see if we can push it higher, go ahead, there's a link in the description. Like always, you can download the project file for this video from my Patreon. There's a link in the description. It's a really great way to help support me and help support the channel and make sure I keep bringing you these videos. There's loads of content on there, so jump over and have a look. Now let's jump into Ableton and get things cooking. Alright guys, so here we are inside Ableton and this is the project I've put together in the style of Simon Doty. So I would say Simon has two slightly different styles. One has got this like really throwback housey piano kind of vibe and one is a bit more heads down peak time progressive. When I was kind of going through deciding what to do, I thought I'd try and take kind of elements from both, but his slightly housier stuff seems to be the more popular stuff, so I figure that's what people would want to know about. But let me know in the comments if you want to see a video on his more peak time progressive stuff, I'm sure we can make that happen. So let's just jump straight in. I'm going to show you the kick drum. This is something that I sampled from one of his tracks. I've got a video which I'll link up here if you want to know about how to sample kick drums. Simon Doty Kick 1. Big, chunky, subby kind of thing. Um, I've pitched it down one semitone. If I hit the spectrum here, and I'll actually turn this up 12. And we can see just by putting the mouse over here that the fundamental is F. And the key of the track that I've done here is A minor. So if I put it down one semitone, that's playing E, which is the fifth of A. So it's all harmoniously that sounds good with the bass line, the piano, everything, and it, it means that there's space in the low end as well. I've just ducked out a little bit here at around 200, as I felt it was a little bit boxy and with the rest of the track. That can be really helpful with kick drums to get, get them to sit sometimes, but I wouldn't just do it by default. Any of this mixing stuff, I try to do as a solution to a problem, not as just something that you have to do. And if you think about things that way, then mixing becomes actually a lot more simple. So standard 4-4 pattern. This is like a really solid, chunky kick drum that really underpins the low end of the track. I'll just play that together with the bass line so you can kind of hear what the low end is doing. So working really well together. It's got a little bit of click, but not too much. Just cuts through the mix, like really, really good. So next, take a look at the claps. So I've got two claps, which I've processed together. Let's just have a look at them. First one. It's like a nice kind of analogy one. This is from my sample pack, Underground Shades of House. Link up here if you want to check it out. And you can see on the sample here that it's kind of got a bit of a slow attack. So that means it's going to be sitting forward from the beat a little bit. And then we've got this one, which is bit tighter, a bit sharper at the start. So those are going to pair together nicely. So you can hear I'm using that for the kind of snap, for the transient. And this one has a bit more character. So together, they're really working in tandem to make kind of like one full sound. In terms of the processing, I've got a bit going on here. In this project, I decided to try out the Ableton Hybrid Reverb, as I normally use the Slate Digital, which 
most of you probably don't have. It's a subscription thing. I don't recommend getting it unless you're doing serious like mixing and stuff. It's pretty expensive and there's plenty of other good things on the market. Like most third party plugins, you definitely don't need it. Everything that comes in Ableton is really, really good. In terms of like buying plugins, the approach I recommend taking is like getting the most out of what you have. And if there's something that you feel is really lacking that you really can't do with what you've got, then maybe consider upgrading. Anyway, this is without the processing. I've got this erosion here. Not really doing too much. Just trying to kind of fill out a little bit of body and kind of glue them together. Now this EQ is just cutting out some of the lows and boosting a little bit of the kind of high end. This is almost around where the open hi-hats would kind of sit. And it's really just to help brighten up the clap a bit. Also very subtle, but it just helps in the mix to kind of help the clap to poke through a little bit more. This glue compressor, which is just controlling the sustain of the, of the clap, kind of helping to make it a bit more punchy and a bit shorter. Again, subtle. In my opinion, mixing should be subtle. The most important thing is the sound selection that you make that's gonna influence the end result the most. And I'm using the saturator for the soft clipping. You'll see I've got a crazy amount of drive here, but I'm bringing the output way down. So when I turn this on, it should sound pretty similar to how it did before. So to my ears, it's pretty much the same, just a little bit louder, but the magic happens here. If we look at the meter here, without the saturator, minus 24.3. With the saturator, minus 24.6. So we've actually got a lower peak volume, but it sounds louder. And that means that when this clap is playing on top of the kick, it's actually now less likely to trigger the limiter, but it sounds louder in the mix. So that's why I'm using the saturator with the soft clipping. It's basically just chopping off the transients. Then we've got some reverb. So I've got some pre-delay on that reverb, which separates the reverb from the clap a little bit and helps to make it feel and sound a bit bigger, but the decay is not too long, so it doesn't get all kind of washed out. This is a trick that I really like these days. I pretty much do this on every mix. Oh, I've also got this snare. So another one from my pack. I've just got a bit of overdrive to kind of pump it up a bit. Cutting out a bit of the low end. You can see I've transposed this down one semitone. So if we look at the spectrum, that fundamental is sitting at D, which is five semitones up from A, the root note of our track, meaning it's in the scale. So everything's going to be sounding nice and harmonic together. So the MIDI here, very classic snare groove for a kind of house beat, just helps to kind of keep it rolling, keep it grooving, and really has some kind of interplay with the kick and the claps. Uh, you can see here, I've just got a really basic call and response where it does on the first bar, it does one beat, then on the second bar, it does two beats with the snare. Very classic. So let's have a look at the hats. There's quite a lot going on in the hats. I noticed with Simon's tracks, I think he uses actually quite a few top loops and things. I tried to program most of the stuff myself, but I have used a couple of loops in here. The first thing I did was programmed this house loop. So if you look at the drum rack, not everything is being used, but I just basically went for some kind of like groovy housey hats. So I'm trying to get like a bit of call and response in there with the hats. So it's working nicely with the claps and the snare. The next thing I've got is a couple of 16th hats. We've got this brush hat, which sounds a bit like a kind of live hi-hat. It's just a sample here, open hat sample. And on the controls here, I've got a bit of randomization on the pan, and I've also got a little bit of randomization on the pitch with this LFO. So if I take that off, it's very subtle. If I turn it up 100%. So the idea with this is just to make it sound a little bit more live, a little bit less static and robotic. So I've got another hat here, 
doing the same pattern, I think, or at least very similar. Yeah, this one has a little bit more emphasis on the offbeat hat. This one's a little bit more rolling, as you can see with the velocity there. On the sample, I'm doing the same thing, a bit of pan randomization and a bit of pitch randomization. And you can see I'm just EQing out the tops there. This brushy hat has got quite a bit of high frequency stuff going on. And also this tambourine loop has quite a bit of high frequency rides. You know, there's a lot going on there. So when you're choosing elements in your hi-hats, I think it's important to be quite specific about where you want them to sit. Because otherwise you can end up with too much energy in one place and, the, and things can get harsh or things can lose punch and definition. So let's listen to the 16th hat. So you can hear that those two things are quite different quite contrasting, so they have plenty of space to sit together. So let's listen to everything together. Let's turn off this house loop first. So adding a lot of pace and a lot of energy to the track with this house loop. Then I've got this tambourine loop here. So this is from like a really old sample pack. I wanted something that sounded quite old and dirty. And this is something that was actually sold on CD. You know, it's really old. And this type of thing is great for two reasons. Like one, you'll be able to find samples that other people aren't using. And two, it gives you this kind of older sound. This sample CD is probably 15 or 20 years old. So the technology was different then. So it was possibly made with hardware and it's and you can kind of hear in the grittiness of the sample. So this is adding a really nice amount of energy and kind of groove in the highs. Adds a real character to the track. And it's also quite wide, which means that there's space for it in the panorama as well. Now let's have a look at this 909 hat. This is just coming from the Ableton 909 core kit. I've got some velocity randomization here and I've pulled the decay right down because I don't want it to be super, super long. We listen to it here. And then I'm also using this glue compressor just to help make it a bit more snappy. That just emphasizes the transient and pulls down the sustain a little bit. Uh, again, I'm just cutting out some of the very highs to make space for these other high frequency elements. And this just really adds a nice pickup in energy when it comes in. Very classic feel. Uh, I've got this hat fill, which is coming from my sample pack again. This is a really cool little thing at the end of each four bar section. I've just changed the loop position so that it happens where I want it. So just add some really nice groove and interest to the hat loop. Something a little bit different than like a snare fill at the end of the bar. Gives a little bit of vibe and character to the drum groove. Uh, then we've got some 707 rides, which are coming from the 707 core kit in Ableton. This is the pattern here. So I'm just, I just tried to make it a little bit more interesting than your standard like offbeat thing. But I am side chaining it with LFO tool. So it ducks out some of those notes, makes them a bit more subtle, but you kind of can hear the click in there subtly. It feels a little bit different than if it's just playing on the off beats. Then I've got this Redux here, just downsampling it. It's subtle, but it's just helping to give it this kind of crunchier vibe. This takes away a little bit of this, this kind of like brittle sparkle on the high end. You can have a look in the EQ here. just very subtly kind of rolls off a little bit here, which makes it feel a bit warmer. Then I've got this auto pan, just moving it around the panorama. And I've got this has width with the delay. So the left and right channels are delayed from one another, which gives it the illusion of being wide, being in the sides. 
You want to be careful with this kind of thing uh, when using any kind of spatial widening like this as it can really affect the mono compatibility of your mixes. So we've got a couple of percussion things, nice and simple. We've got this distorted percussion hit. And this is just coming from a longer one shot. Let me just find that, show in browser. So it's kind of like two in one, but I felt like this really kind of fit in the groove and the tone fit with the key of the track. So good to go. So it really adds an interesting texture and groove to the drum beat. Because of the distorted nature of the sample, it gives it like a bit more of a gritty kind of heavy feel. Then we've got this wood percussion. Let's do the same show in browser. So it's just kind of a wood block or something like that. Also coming from my sample pack. And what I've done here is I've tuned it down 12 semitones, but you'll notice that I'm playing here on C3 but also playing up at C4. So we've got kind of alternating tones coming from it. So again, just trying to add in some call and response here. So a simple but chunky, energetic drum beat. That's what we're going for. Some nice call and response in there to keep it interesting. I think it's important for drums to be quite simple or at least as simple as possible, but still to kind of infuse some character and some kind of signature sound into them. And that's really being done with the percussion. As you can hear from these drums, uh, Simon's tracks have a kind of tech housey influence compared to the more typical progressive or melodic techno sounds that you find on similar labels that he releases with. So that's kind of part of his signature sound. Tech housey drums combined with more progressive type elements. So let's have a look at the bass. It's a really simple one here. So this is the MIDI. So we're just going across the G, up to A, the root note, down to the F, and then finally just finishing off with the E, which is the perfect fifth. So this chord progression sounds really nice, and that's mirroring what's happening in the piano here, but we'll get to that. So the sound design for this is pretty simple. We're using wavetable. I just decided to switch it up here. I've used these log saw wavetables. They're in the vintage section. I'm not sure exactly where they're from, but they sound really nice. Initially, I did have just one. But then I put another one, which is up 12 semitones. The first one is downtuned to minus 12 semitones. just gives it like a bit more character and tone. I'm not using a sub because we're playing quite low. We've got a low pass filter, 12 dB per octave, slope, no resonance, a bit of drive with the MS20 algorithm. Then I've got a bit of envelope modulation, which is just leading through a little bit of the high end at the start of each note. just giving it that kind of really sharp, plucky sound, but not too much. I, I noticed that most of Simon's tracks, not all of them, but most of them have like a pretty subby bass line. The amp envelope, very standard, short release, just adding to that plucky nature. I've also added in a delay, and I've put it into this audio effects rack so that I can filter out any of the lows. So that just really helps to add a little bit more vibe and character to the bass. Very subtle. I've used the volume here just to mix in just enough to give it that kind of vibe that I'm looking for. Cool stuff. I'm um, just cutting out some of the really low subs and then using an LFO tool just to duck it to the kick a bit. This rack here with the filter I use to cut out the low frequencies when I bring the bass back in in the break. Okay, let's look at the melodic stuff we've got going on here. So the piano, this seems to be something that Simon uses really commonly in maybe half of his tracks. But as I said at the start, the piano tracks seem to be the ones that are kind of doing really well. So I assumed that's kind of what people are knowing him for. Although I think a lot of his stuff does pretty well. 
So I didn't want to go for the standard piano house kind of riff, as I've done a few videos that have got that type of thing here. I've got this one here about piano house and this one here on progressive breaks, both of which have like piano house style riffs. So you can check them out. But I am using my house piano rack. So that is available to download in the project. And then you can just save it to Ableton and have it available. It's like a multi, it's a multi sampled instrument of the Korg M1 classic house piano. The sound that we all know and love. Cool. So we've got this chord progression going on here. And if we look at the bass notes here, we can see the progression. It's going G, A, F, F, E at the end. So that's the same as the bass line was doing. I actually did the piano first and then changed the bass line to fit the piano, to follow the piano. So these chords here, maybe they look complicated, but they're really not. It's actually just a minor ninth. So it's the G, so there's the minor triad, plus the F, plus the A, and then the G has just been inverted down one. So then I've just got the perfect fifth again, doubled an octave below, and then we just transpose the root note to make the bass. So if we hear it like this, oh. let's listen here. And then if we transpose that down, just adds a little bit more depth. And the automation is just opening up the filter as it goes along through the break. So we're using the reverb that's built into the rack to add some reverb. And then I'm using an external delay instead of the built-in one, just so I could have a bit more control of that. Then I'm using some LFO tool, but I've, only, I've got it turned down to 73%. So it's... So I'm trying to do some subtle ducking with that, just making some space for the kick, but trying not to give the piano too much of a pumping sound. Okay, so we've got this arpeggio, and let's take a listen to it. So what I've done here is got a bit crazy, based on the same simple chord progression of the piano, if you look closely, but I've just put in some kind of little extra notes and some breaks, which really affects the way that the arpeggiator responds and makes it a bit more random, gives it a bit more of a unique vibe. So it sounds a bit more interesting than just your standard repetitive arpeggio. In terms of the actual arpeggiator setting, I've got it playing 16th notes and using this converge style. Then I actually felt like I wasn't getting enough low end out of the synth, it didn't have enough body. So each of those notes that comes out of the arpeggiator is then being duplicated with this chord device down an octave. So if I turn that off, So it adds quite a bit more body to the sound. And then just to be sure, I'm using this scale to make sure that it pushes everything into the A minor scale. So I can just close those up, make some space. This is the preset that I'm using. It's from the Ableton Live library and I've just kind of modified it a bit using these controls. If I duplicate this track, I can show you what it sounded like originally. So I'll turn this stuff off and hit that hot swap button, reset it. So pretty awful. Then with the effects. So I'm using those effects really to add a lot more brightness with these with this different distortion. But you can hear without the effects, I've still messed around with the settings quite a bit to make it sound cool, interesting. So here on the modified sound, let's take a listen. And compare it. So literally all I did here was surf through some presets to try and find something that I thought could work and then messed around with the dials. It's not rocket science and that's kind of the way I work a lot of the time, but I find the important thing to get good results quickly is to have an idea in mind of what you're actually searching for. If you're just randomly searching through presets in the hope that something will reveal itself, then it can be quite a frustrating and time-consuming activity. I don't recommend that.
So I'm using this EQ to cut out a bunch of the low frequencies, which we don't need. That area is being, all being utilized by other elements. And I'm using the volume automation on this rack to bring it in in the break. And I'm also using the high cut to filter it in, in the break. So it kind of just starts sneaking in subtly. You can see here, as we get close to the drop, I'm actually starting to filter out more of the low end. So the highs are opening up, but the low end is disappearing, which helps to give this kind of rising effect. And then when it all drops back in, it sounds like really impactful. You could hear there, you can hear the big washy reverb on that that's being sent here. This is one of the standard returns on my template. I'll link a video up here where you can check out my full template and you can download it from Patreon as well. So this is just like a really long uh, washy delay, reverb, sorry. Great for build-ups and effects. So now let's have a look at this stab. It's kind of like a techno-ish stab. The inspiration for this came from Simon's track Reality Check. Really cool track. Uh, it was the first track on his new label. So not exactly the same as the one in his track, but doing a similar job. So you can hear there's a bit of difference between the stab in the first bar and the stab in the second bar. That's being automated here, do do do, and that relates to the filter frequency of this wavetable. So in the MIDI, we've got the root note, A, D, F, and then A again. So if I turn on the scale here, click A, minor, you can see I've just tried some other notes as well. If I turn those on. So I was just trying different notes to see what kind of tones and textures I could get. But I felt like this combination of notes gave it the kind of dark vibe that I was going for. So in terms of the sound design, I've just got one sawtooth oscillator. We've got a very, very tight filter with a 12 dB per octave, uh, quite a bit of drive, and then a tight modulation envelope, which is doing quite a bit to the filter. So that's what's creating this real pluckiness. So it's got no sustain and a tight decay. If I open up the decay a bit more, But that's not what we're looking for. So I'm using the unison here with three voices, 12%, just to add some width. If I turn that off. Nice and wide. Chorus ensemble to add a bit more width and also kind of add some variation. So each time it plays, it sounds a little different. It's not too audible of a difference. Then we've got a delay and I've got the left and right channels offset a little bit so that the delay is a bit wider than the original sound. Very short feedback. <laughs> then I'm using a reverb here, the hybrid reverb from Ableton. This is basically just to add a bit of sustain and vibe to the sound. I've also sent it to some reverb from my from the return channel. So this is more of a sound design kind of thing, which is then being fed into this overdrive. So the overdrive brings up the reverb. So I just kind of experimented with this to see what sounded good, really. I'm using this glue compressor to control the dynamics a bit. So it just helps to make it nice and controlled and snappy. And then this saturator is again doing soft clipping. So we're just taking away the transient of that sharp pluck. Sounds pretty much the same, but it's just not going to trigger the limiter. And I'm cutting out the lows that we don't need. Sending it to some reverb and some ping pong dotted eighth note delay. Now we've got this drone playing root note, two octaves, just like a held string type thing. So we've got two sawtooth oscillators. This one's up 12 semitones. 
I've just got a little, little bit of amplification envelope so that it's a slightly bit louder when it plays, just helps to kind of give a bit of rhythm. So a lot of the vibe of the sound is being done by this unison here. If I turn that off. So we've got eight voices. And then I'm using this LFO to modulate the amount, just subtly. But it means that it's constantly changing and it always sounds a little bit more random. Turn this off, or if I delete this LFO, so that's the effect that it's doing, but just a bit more subtly. Then I'm cutting out the lows and the mids that we don't need, and then I'm just using this filter to automate it so that it increases in intensity throughout the track. It really helps to build into the transitions. LFO tool to just kind of duck it and give it some vibe, and then I'm sending it to a bit of reverb. Just a bit of an alternative to the classic house high string type thing. This has a bit more of a serious clubby kind of vibe, so it fits the style of Simon's music quite well. And it's something that I noticed that he uses quite a lot. It's a really common feature in progressive house and melodic techno. So vocals. Simon's pretty good at choosing really cool vocals. Uh, this is just from Loop Cloud. It's all right, not that great. It's just a couple of lines from the start of a longer sample. It's got a bit of a retro housey vibe. So you can hear a lot of delay. I've got some overdrive on it just to kind of give it this gritty, older kind of sound. I want it to sound like it's sampled from an old track. So if I turn off all of this, see it's a bit more polished sounding. So I'm using the glue compressor just to control the dynamic. So it's really squashing the dynamic. It's quite a heavy compression. And the overdrive is just really giving some vibe really making it gritty. Then I'm just using this EQ to cut out some of the lows and pump up the kind of fundamental of the voice just to help it pop through. I've got the Tell Chorus LX adding a bit of chorus. Uh, this is a free plugin so go download it, it's awesome. Then I've got this big long delay just to really help it kind of fill out and echo through the track. Then I've got this other little like one shot that I've taken from the same sample. You can see in this one, I've actually used the envelope to take out these parts, but in this, it's playing from one of these parts. So on here, I've just used the same processing chain, but I've cut out some of the highs with the EQ, just so that it kind of sits in the background. Then what we've done here is I recorded this to audio, put a reverb on it, 100% wet, long decay, froze it. Then I copied that to this track here and created a riser out of it, which comes into this vocal, so it kind of, they all kind of work together. They both kind of work together. So it just creates a cool transition effect here. You quite likely heard something else there, which is this vocal pad. Now let me take off the processing so we can just hear it in its original form. So nothing special at all. It's just playing at the start of the bar. All the magic is being done by this processing. So let me just turn these off one by one. So we've got this filter delay. Then we've got another ping pong delay. Then we're going into a reverb. So I'm making it like nice and washy. Then I'm using the EQ to cut out some of the lows. This just really sits in the back of the track and gives it like a vibe and a texture, but also really adds some energy. So if I turn it off and play the track, So it's cool, but it sounds quite deep, especially with that pad. Now I'm going to turn this on.
really groovy and vibey. I probably should be ducking that with the LFO tool. Let's just have a listen to how it sounds. A bit more controlled, so let's keep that on. Moving on to the effects group. Simon's tracks are a bit more sparse on the effects than other Progressive House producers. So what I've got here is this snare fill with a bunch of reverb on it. And then this one here is being sent to a big delay. The reason I've put the delay here is because it comes into the break, so it's just kind of ringing out a bit further. Then we've got this white noise riser. Cool, standard stuff. And then a white noise like downlifter. Quite a big one. And this is much more of a progressive house type of sound. On this snare fill just before the drop, I've just taken this first hit, duplicated it back to make a bit more of a fill. And coming in underneath that is a snare riser. So to automate this and make it sound a bit more interesting, I've got a bit of pan randomization on it. And then I'm using the EQ with some automation. I'm slowly bringing in the lows. So you can hear it's got less low frequency here. And then here it lets through the fundamental. So that really ramps up the intensity. Then we're increasing the volume automation. Cool stuff. And then together with this snare fill and this riser, works nice. So that is Simon Doty. As always, you can download the project file from my Patreon. There's a link in the description. Go over there. There's like so many project files on there now. It's a bit out of control. As I said earlier, if you want me to do another Simon Doty video focusing on his more kind of peak time progressive stuff, then let me know in the comments and we'll see if we can get that done. So now let's listen through the track and see how all of these sounds work together to create that signature Simon Doty sound. Right, guys there you go i hope you enjoyed this it was really fun to get in there and try and figure out what makes simon's music simon's music he really is a great artist and he deserves all the success that he's having at the moment so if you want to show him some love jump over to beatport and spotify and support his music if you like this style of video then check out this playlist there's a whole bunch of artists in there that i've covered i'm sure there's something that you'll like anyway that's it from me today we'll catch you next time peace <laughs>